you to excuse me for one moment. Well, hello. My name is Josiah. That uh, Chris Wright fellow asked me to tell you my story. He seems to have disappeared somewhere. So, as I said, I'm Josiah. I've been a follower of Jesus now for many years. Actually, I, first of all, I was a follower of John the Baptist. That was when my friend Gideon and I, we went down to the Jordan River to hear this John fellow because he was preaching down there and we thought, well, that's interesting, let's go. Everybody was going to see John and we went and we heard his message and he was telling us that God is coming soon and God's kingdom is going to come soon and we needed to get ready. And in order to get ready, we needed to repent and confess our sins and start walking in the ways of God. And Gideon and me, we thought, he's right. So we did. And we confessed our sins and we were baptized by John in the Jordan River. So we kept going back because we wanted to follow him. We wanted to hear his message. And he noticed us and he actually gave us a job to do to control some of the crowds that were coming to John because everybody was coming. It was like a, a national revival. People were coming from all over the country, ordinary people, nasty people. I saw even some prostitutes and tax collectors and all sorts of people were coming, but they were confessing their sin and being baptized by John in the Jordan. And John was telling us that God was coming back. God was coming to, and here's the thing, John was speaking and acting like a prophet. I mean, like those prophets that we knew about from our scriptures, like Elijah, and Elisha, and others. But we haven't had a prophet in our country, in Israel, for about 400 years. And yet here again, it seemed that God had sent us a prophet who was speaking to us the words of God. In fact, he was so much of a prophet that some people were actually saying, John must be the Messiah. He's the one whom God had sent, the anointed one of us. And John said, no, 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 not me. I'm not the Messiah. I'm just a messenger boy. I've just been sent to prepare the way for him when he comes. And then one day, one of John's relatives, a man called Jesus from Nazareth, he came. And John recognized him, knew him. And John knew that this Jesus was the one he was talking about, the Messiah. And Jesus asked John to baptize him. And John was very reluctant. He said, no, no, you should be baptizing me, not me baptizing you. But Jesus said, no, I, I want you to. It, it, it was like Jesus wanted to be one of us, just to be part of the crowd, to, to just be with us and be baptized with us. So he was, John baptized Jesus. And then after that, John told us to follow Jesus. He said, look, guys, you need to go and follow him. He's the Messiah. He's going to become greater and greater, and me, I'm just going to fade away, but that doesn't matter. Follow Jesus, he said. So we did. Of course, we didn't abandon John. I mean, John was our master. We were John's disciples. We loved him, and we went on caring for him, especially after he was thrown in prison by that Herod fellow. John was in that awful stinking prison. It was a terrible place. You can't imagine it. It was dark. It was cold. There were rats. People were ill. I mean, John himself, he, he, he was beaten, I think. He was tortured, probably. I mean, Herod was vicious like that. He got ill. He got very thin. 
I mean, not that he'd been particularly fat before. I mean, you should have seen the things he used to eat out in the wilderness. <laughs> but anyway, there was John in prison. So Gideon and me, we spent some of our days following Jesus, going around with him and the crowds that were following him. And then other days we would go and visit John in prison and take him food and water and some warm clothes. So one day we were in those crowds with Jesus as we were coming close to a village, a village called Nain. And it was an awful sad day. We could tell even as we got close because there was a crowd coming out of the village and they were weeping and wailing. So we asked somebody what's happened. And they pointed to four men who were carrying a stretcher and there was obviously a dead body. This was a funeral. And then we saw just beside the body this woman weeping, wailing. And they told us, well, that's the boy's mother. And he's her only son. And he's died. And worse than that, actually, it was only a few months ago her husband died. So she's a widow and she's got nobody left. And so we, we watched because... Jesus was obviously moved, deeply moved. There were tears in his eyes as he went up to the woman and he said to her, don't cry. And we thought, what a strange thing to say to a woman who's lost her son and her husband, don't cry. But somehow Jesus just kept looking at her and she calmed down, she stopped Crying. And then he went to the men carrying the stretcher and he touched the stretcher and he said to the boy who everybody knew was dead, he says, get up. And the boy sat up. The men were so shocked that he dropped him. And he sat up and Jesus pulled him off, lifted him up. He started talking, well, where am I? What's happening? Why is everybody crying? And Jesus took him back to his mother and they hugged and the whole crowd were stunned into silence for a few seconds and then someone shouted he's a great prophet Jesus is a prophet who's come back God has come to help his people and everybody began to shout that God has come to help his people and we I thought, that's exactly what John told us that his father had said when he was born. God has come to help his people. So what they meant, of course, was that if God was the one who has the power to raise the dead, then only a great man of God, like, say, Elisha or Elijah, who raised the dead in our scriptures, only a great man of God could, in some sense, draw down the power of God to raise the dead. So if God was doing it again, then Jesus must be a great prophet. God has come to help his people. Well, Gideon and me, we legged it back to John as fast as we could. We got into that prison and we told John what we'd seen, what we'd heard. And John was, well, impressed. He was yeah, sure. But it was strange because he seemed somehow uncertain. He, he, he seemed a bit confused. I mean, it could have been just that he was in pain. I think he'd just been beaten again. He was certainly starving with hunger. But there was something in which he just didn't seem to know exactly how to respond. So he said, yeah, well, he said... Uh, he must be a great prophet, Jesus, if he can raise the dead. But is he really the Messiah? Or is he perhaps just another forerunner of the Messiah like me? I mean, after all, he said, when I was born, my father said I was a great prophet. And that God was coming to help his people. But that was 30 years ago. And, and if he really is the Messiah, then why hasn't he rescued his people? Why isn't he somehow coming to bring us redemption and salvation and making things happen 
And why hasn't he got me out of this prison? He was so confused, nothing seemed to be happening. So he shook his head for a while and then he looked up at us and he said, okay, you two guys, Josiah, Gideon, I want you to go back to Jesus, find Jesus. And I want you to ask him this question, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for somebody else? You got that? He made us repeat it. Are you the one who is to come or shall we look for someone else? And we said, yeah, are you the one who is to come? Yeah, yeah, okay, got it. And we set off to find Jesus. Two men with a mission. And a lot depended on the answer. Well, it wasn't hard to find Jesus. I mean, there was always a crowd wherever he was. So we went, we found him in a bit of open countryside. There were some olive trees, a few bushes. Just there he was and people all around. And Jesus was just moving among them, talking to them putting his hand on his shoulder here and speaking to someone there, hugging another man here. And then sometimes he would take someone's head in his hands and gently open their eyes that they could see if they'd been blind. Or he would touch their ears and for the first time they could hear the birds sing. Or a child that had been unable to speak from childhood and he opened their lips and they were able to speak to their mommy and daddy. And then further over there was a whole commotion of people yelling and shouting and screaming and someone was obviously possessed with an evil spirit and Jesus went over and commanded the spirit to go and the man calmed down. It was riveting. It was amazing. Somebody should write those stories down. It was incredible to see what was happening. (laughs) Well, we didn't dare interrupt Jesus for a while because obviously these people's need was far greater than ours. But eventually, about the middle of the day, when it became very hot, Jesus took a break and he went and he sat down on a rock under a scrubby tree and his disciples brought him some bread and some water to drink to refresh him. So we took up our courage and we went up to Jesus and said, "Um, excuse me, master, but we've come from John, your cousin. You know John who's in prison? And Jesus said, yes, I, I know he's in prison. And we said, well, he's asked us to ask you, master, are you the one who is to come or should we look for someone else? And I have to say, I wasn't too sure how Jesus would answer. I mean, would he get angry? Would he say, of course I am. And can't you see my halo, you know? (laughs) Or, you know, might have had one of these things that you've got, these labels, you know? Jesus of Nazareth, real Messiah, you know? (laughs) But he didn't. He didn't tell us it was a silly question. He just stood up. And he put his arms on our shoulders and he turned us around with his arms around us to look. And he said, just look what's happening here. Can't you see? What do you hear? And we could see people happy together. We saw parents with their children. We saw people using their legs again and getting tested in the mind. And Jesus said, go back and tell John what you can see, what's happening. And that was a bit disappointing, really, because, I mean, we'd already done that. After what we saw at Nain, when Jesus raised the dead boy, we'd gone back and told John what was happening, and it hadn't convinced him then, so why would it convince him now? I mean, why couldn't Jesus just give us a simple answer, you know? Are you or are you not the Messiah? Yes or no? But he didn't. He wouldn't. Or at least that's the way it seemed to us. Well, we didn't argue. I mean, it wasn't a good idea to argue with Jesus. I'd noticed that. Uh, Every time somebody started an argument with him, it usually ended badly for them. So we 
went back to John rather slowly because it was very hard to tell him that, well, Jesus hadn't really given us a straight answer. And, and we felt a bit pathetic for maybe we should have pressed Jesus a bit harder. But, I mean, would you argue with Jesus? So at first, John just hung his head and he looked so, so disappointed, so dejected. It was almost as if, well, if he had been hoping that Jesus would come and rescue him, he'd no hope of that now. But then, then he looked up and he said to us, is that all Jesus said? And I said, well, not quite uh, everything, but I mean, the rest of what he said was what we could see for ourselves. But John said, yes, but what did Jesus actually say? So I thought, well, uh, I said, trying hard to remember Jesus' exact words, um, he said, let me think. I said, go back and report to John what you see and heard, yeah? Yeah. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and um, uh, what else? Oh, yes, and good news is preached to the poor. Uh, oh, uh, and uh, he said, and blessed is the one who doesn't stumble because of me. Yeah, yeah, that's what he said, but like I said, John, we could see all that for ourselves. And John stared at us for a moment. And then his face slowly broke into a huge smile. And, and right there in the darkness and dirt of the prison, I could see the white of his teeth as he grinned and his great black bearded face cracked open in a smile. <laughs> and then he, he started to chuckle. And then he started to laugh. <laughs> And we said, what? What are you laughing at? And he said, <laughs> he said, don't you get it? He said, don't you guys understand? Don't you realize that what Jesus was doing? <laughs> he said, he's quoting Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, the scriptures, he said. Oh, he's a typical Jesus. He, he, he always has to join the dots and make connections with the scriptures, he said. Listen, guys. And then John, when he stopped laughing, he said, listen to this. You see, John knew the scriptures. He probably had most of the scriptures in his memory. And he started to quote in a voice that was trembling but triumphant. And he quoted the scriptures. He said, say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance. He will come with retribution. But he will come to save you. And then, then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped and the lame will leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy and the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He said, and then he added, it's him, it's him, said John. He's the one, God's promised one, the one who is to come, God's Messiah. I was right, he said, I was right. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then we joined him and we laughed with him and we sang a psalm of praise together. But then, then another thought occurred to me, even at that moment. That prophecy of Isaiah that John quoted, what was it it said? Your God will come. And then all these things will happen. So if God has now promised to do what God is now doing and Jesus is doing it, then who's Jesus? He's not just a great prophet, though obviously he is. He's not even just 
the Messiah of Israel whom God promised to send. No, your God will come. The Lord God, our God, the God of Israel himself is among us. That took my breath away. That was hard to take in, just thinking about that. So I talked to Gideon, and we went and talked to some of Jesus' disciples, and they were just as astonished as we were. It was so hard to get our heads around this, to make sense of this. But the more we watched Jesus, and the more we listened to the things he said, the more it became clear that he was saying and doing things that only God could do. I mean, when Jesus would say, I tell you, it was like God himself was speaking. When Jesus would say to this one or that one, your sins are forgiven, well, we knew that they were, but only God can forgive sins. And then his disciples told us of that day when they'd been out on the lake on the Sea of Galilee in a boat with Jesus and a storm had come up and the waves were swelling and the boat was nearly sinking and they thought they were going to drown and Jesus just stood up in the back of the boat and says, shut up! And the wind stopped and the waves calmed down and they said, who is this guy that even the wind and the waves obey him? And then this thought occurred to me. We remembered what John kept on saying. When people asked who he was, John would always say, look, here's who I am. And he would quote Isaiah. He would say, I'm just a voice crying in the wilderness. Make way for the Lord. Prepare the way for the Lord. But John had prepared the way for Jesus. So if John prepared the way for Jesus and was the voice preparing the way for the Lord, then who was Jesus? Again and again, we thought this. It took a long time to sink in, but we knew eventually that God had kept his promise. God's kingdom had arrived because Jesus was here. And the kingdom of God had come in all sorts of small and surprising ways. But now we knew that following Jesus was what it meant to belong to God's kingdom. It meant living in God's way. That walking with Jesus would be walking in God's way as the scriptures told us to. In repentance and faith and obedience as the true children of Israel walking in God's way. So we go back to that day when we were there with John in the prison. I mean, it was such a fantastic day. We were so encouraged. We were so happy to see John encouraged. I mean, to hear him laugh for the first time and to see his face smiling, knowing that Jesus was the Messiah and Lord that he had prepared for. It was such a comfort to him in prison. And it was such a joy and such a hope and strength for our faith. John was not wrong. John had led us to repentance for our sin. And then John had introduced us to Jesus as Messiah and Lord. And the kingdom of God was among us. And we had faith and we had hope. But... But then our hopes all suffered a devastating shock just a few months later. When our master John ended up with his head on a plate carried in by a dancing girl at the request of her mother in Herod's palace. And only a few months after that, Jesus, our master, ended up with his hands and his feet nailed to a Roman cross. Both our masters brutally slaughtered 
And these were the two masters that we had pinned our hopes on by responding to John and then by trusting and following Jesus. I mean, how can your faith survive a shock like that? How can you have hope when you've hoped in the kingdom of God but it seems like the kingdom of Herod and the empire of Rome have won and they're just laughing at you. How can hope survive when that kind of thing happens? Well, let me tell you. This is the best bit. There are two things that kept us going. Two things that gave us hope and still do. Hope that will not be destroyed. Here's the first. God raised Jesus from the dead. No kidding, he did. A few days after his crucifixion, some of his disciples told us that they'd seen him, they'd touched him, they'd eaten with him. Fantastic. I mean, somebody needs to write those stories down as well. I mean, it was amazing what they were saying. Jesus is alive. (laughs) And then you know what? Gideon and me, we saw him too one day. Along with a big crowd, there were about 500 other people. And we were there. And we saw Jesus more alive even on that day when we'd first met him and asked him that question. And I remember thinking, oh, I wish John could have seen the risen Jesus. And then I thought, huh, actually he has. (laughs) I laughed about that too. So you see, we know that if God has defeated death through the death and resurrection of Jesus, the Messiah, our Lord, then we know that whatever happens to us, nothing can destroy our hope and faith, no matter what they do to us. And some of us have already been killed for our faith, like Stephen and James. But we know God raised Jesus from the dead. I suppose you've you've probably heard of that Saul of Tarsus fella. Um, Paul the Apostle, I think he calls himself now because he spends so much time among the Gentiles. I haven't met him myself actually, but from time to time he writes these letters and they get circulated around uh, the churches, the places, the little communities of believers like the one where Gideon and I meet. And one time one came and I was so struck by what he said that I wrote down and kept it on a scrap of parchment myself. Let me see, have I got it here? Yeah, here we are. This was what the Apostle Paul wrote. He said this, and it's so encouraging to Gideon and me in our faith. He said, if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised him from the dead is living in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ has died. More than that, was raised to life and is at the right hand of God interceding for us. So who then shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Because as it is written... For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow. I wish I could write stuff like that. 
Doesn't that lift your heart? Doesn't that give you hope? (laughs) You see, old Herod, he could separate John's head from his body, but he couldn't separate John from God's love. No, no. John is with his Lord more than conqueror. So that's the first thing. God raised Jesus from the dead and we know he will keep our lives safe in him. But here's the other thing. Going back to that day in the prison, do you remember remember that passage from Isaiah that Jesus quoted and John remembered? Well, I checked this out because I could remember some other things there that, that I thought Isaiah had said. I went to the synagogue. I was able to check it on the scroll of Isaiah because those words of the prophet Isaiah don't stop with the wonderful things that were going to happen when God would come, the things that Jesus did in his earthly life. No, Isaiah goes on to envisage a whole new world of joy and abundance that lies ahead still. He pictures in his words, not a stairway to heaven, but a highway into the city of God. Listen to what Isaiah says. He says, a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there. No ravenous beasts, nor they will not be found there. But only the redeemed will walk there. And those that the Lord has rescued, they will return. They will enter Zion with singing and everlasting joy will crown their heads and gladness and joy will overtake them and sorrow and sighing will flee away. So you see, we can endure shocks, suffering, persecution, hardship, even martyrdom if it should come because we know that one day we will walk with the redeemed into the city of God. And we look forward to that day, Gideon and me. We look forward to the day when everlasting joy will crown our heads and gladness and joy will overtake us and sorrow and sighing will flee away. So you see, remember that day when we went to ask Jesus that, that day when we told John back in the prison, that was the day when we knew that God was keeping his word, his word in the scriptures, his word through the prophets. God was keeping his promise. And we know that God always will because God kept his word when Jesus first came And so we know that God will keep his word when Jesus comes again. And it's in that absolute certainty of our hope from the scriptures and from knowing the living Lord Jesus Christ that we will go on following him, whatever they do to us. Because you see, we know the story that we are in, Gideon and me we know how that story will end because we know the crucified and risen and ascended Lord Jesus Christ. And so do you. Well, that brother Chris told me to tell you my story. So I have, so God be with you.